Hello my friends, HM here. In this video I'm going to talk about the suggestion that was made by the French President Macron about sending troops to Ukraine. Why is that suggestion coming up right now at this time and how might such a deployment of troops actually look like? Let's talk about it. Okay, so I found a few tweets here about what it was that Macron actually suggested. Macron suggests Western nation might send troops to Ukraine saying France is not against sending them. Sweden, Poland and Czech Republic quickly dismissed the idea. Now, both Sweden, Poland and Czech Republic have been very pro-Ukraine. So when they dismiss the idea, you know that it's probably not going to be popular with other countries as well. And then we have tweets down here that says Germany, Hungary, Slovakia won't send troops to Ukraine. Now, we know Hungary would never do it. They have been against helping Ukraine from the start and Slovakia just got a new government and after they got this new government they stopped sending arms to Ukraine but they haven't been obstructing other EU countries from sending arms to Ukraine like Hungary has and Germany what about them well after the second world war they have been quite pacifist and very scared of any engagement anywhere so it's a natural reaction from them then um, there's one more here about NATO's secretary general Jens Stoltenberg confirms no plan for NATO combat troops in Ukraine despite providing unprecedented support since 2014 Jens Stoltenberg is definitely a friend of Ukraine so you could say with all this thumbs down about this plan from Macron why even make a video about it it's not going to go anywhere well the reason we should make a video about it is that pretty much every aid that has come to Ukraine started with we're not going to do that we're not going to send heavy weapons to Ukraine but we started sending heavy artillery and tanks to Ukraine and then it was we're not going to send airplanes to Ukraine but now the airplanes are coming and um I think this is a planned thing. It could be much more than it pretend to be. And France is simply airing a thought to get the reactions from the Russians and get the Russians used to this idea that troops from NATO countries might end up in Ukraine. And this is just the first step in this diplomatic process of kind of luring in this next step to have Russia accept it. Now, the first thing we should talk about about such a plan is how would it look like in the first phase it was going to happen? And I think it would happen at the minimum interference and the minimum probability for actually having any combat engagement with Russia. But that would still help Ukraine. How would that look like? Well, here I have a map. We have Ukraine's border up here with Belarus. We have Ukraine's border here with Poland and then furthermore Ukraine's border with Slovakia and Hungary and Romania all the way down here. And then we have the Black Sea down here and we have Russia here and then we have the red area here is the temporary occupied territories of Ukraine that Russia has occupied. And the front line, let's zoom in a little bit. This is not really a front line because there's water in between that divides this front line here. So there's not much fighting over this water here. Pretty much all the fighting is done at the front line here where there's land where they can attack each other directly. And that's this front line down here where you can also see all the red stuff are Russian regiments and army troops from different uh, parts of the Russian army that are deployed here. That's why you have the front line. Let's go up here and zoom a little bit out. All this border here is Ukraine's border with Russia, but Ukraine control all of Ukraine there, but Russia hasn't invaded there. So how could you deploy troops from European countries in Ukraine without risking any direct combat with Russia, unless they attack deliberately? Well, you could deploy troops along the border up here between Belarus and Ukraine. Uh, the problem for Ukraine is that they have to keep a lot of troops up here, possibly 50,000, to protect that border against a potential attack from Belarus or Russian troops in Belarus. There are very few Russian troops in Belarus, but maybe suddenly they could fly a lot of troops in and then start attacking here. So Ukraine has to keep a lot of troops there just in case that they are attacked. The reason it's important to protect this border is that Ukraine is getting all of its supply from Poland 
And if these supplies are cut by a surprise attack, well, then Ukraine will quickly lose the war. So what could happen in a first phase would be that Europe simply replaced the Ukraine army protecting that border with NATO troops that moved in here. They would be far away from the actual action where there's some fighting, which would be down here. How far away? Let's take a measurement there to down here. That's 600 kilometers away from the nearest point that NATO troops would be stationed to the actual front line. Also, if NATO move in here, they would need to move in with Patriot batteries, of course, to protect troops against being hit by Russian missiles, cruise missiles and stuff, so they can shoot those down if they come in. And they would also need air cover, because NATO would never move in without air cover. So they would need to fly patrols over this stretch of the border with F-35s. That would be the most capable airplane that NATO countries have, also European NATO countries. My own country, Denmark, has four of them currently in Denmark, and we have six others that are training with Danish pilots in the United States. I think they are very soon going to be moved to Denmark. So Denmark has 10 F-35s that we could deploy. We we'll probably not deploy all of them, but we could definitely contribute to a force that would patrol this stretch of land and use air bases in Poland. Now there is one other border where Ukraine could be relieved. That's down here in this area with Moldova. The fact is that there are some Russian separatists that have taken military control of a part of Moldova. And one way to further relieve Ukraine army from taking care that these separatists here don't attack into Ukraine, they have to keep some troops there. Also, there are about 1,500 Russian soldiers based there, and they have a lot of arms stock from the breakup of the Soviet Union that are still there, so they're heavily armed. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but the idea is that a first phase of a plan to deploy troops in Ukraine could simply start with putting in 50,000 troops uh, to protect this border with Belarus so that Ukraine could move 50,000 troops to the front line and also further protect the border between Russia and Ukraine here. And Ukraine probably also has some 10,000 troops that are making sure that they're not attacked from the rear by these 1,500 Russian troops that are deployed in this part of Moldova. Maybe NATO should also just put 10,000 troops down there to be sure that Ukraine is protected so that Ukraine can again concentrate on the front line. Now, it's strange that there's a part down here in Moldova that's occupied by Russian army and also some Russian separatists, basically Russian immigrants that have taken up arms and taken military control over a part of Moldova. So I want to go a little bit into that and say what's up and down there. And here on Wikipedia, you can read that Moldova is a country that spans a total of 33,000 square kilometers or 13,000 square miles. So it's a very small country and it has a population of two and a half million people. And that's including... Uh, those separatists that are even a smaller fraction. And then it says further, the unrecognized breakaway state of Transnistria lies across the Dniester River and the country's eastern border with Ukraine. So they're completely surrounded by Ukraine on one side and then the rest of Moldova on the other side. Let's see what this Transnistria is. Well, the population here, how many are they? It's a population of 360,000 people. And then you should think that they were all Russians, but that's not true. Only 29.1% of them are Russians. But there are a military base there that was there at the beginning of the breakup of the Soviet Union with Russian soldiers on it. And they have just stayed there since the breakup of the Soviet Union. And there was a war. I'll just read this. Starting from 2nd March 1992, there was concerted military action between Moldova and Transnistria. The fighting intensified throughout early 1992. The former Soviet 14th Guards Army entered the conflict in its final stage, opening fire against Moldovan forces. Approximately 700 people were killed, and Moldova has since exercised no effective control or influence on Transnistrian authorities. A ceasefire agreement signed on 21st of July 1992 has held to the present day. So that's the situation about that country. It's just odd that it's there, but uh, that's the story behind it. 
Now the final part here of my video will discuss some reasons for why Marcon is floating this idea about sending troops to Ukraine. Why is it coming up now? Why wasn't it discussed earlier? Why is it now? It's happening now because the situation on the battlefield, I have to say it, it's not looking good for Ukraine. They have lost Avdika, they have lost many smaller cities along the front line, and there is a reason that they are losing, and I'm going to give you a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one of the reasons is that Russia has solved their shortages of ammunition by being armed by North Korea, who in no less than six months has provided Russia with three million heavy-duty artillery shells in six months. I have a tweet here that says South Korea estimates that Pyongyang, that's North Korea, has sent about 7,000 containers to Russia, which can hold about three million of these heavy-duty artillery shells. So Russia has lots of artillery that they're hammering Ukraine troops with. So how is the supply of artillery shells for Ukraine? Well, there's this another tweet here from Macron who said that the EU's promise to supply 1 million heavy-duty artillery shells to Ukraine was a lie from the beginning because it was not realistic. The EU countries don't have the production capacity to supply 1 million shells uh, quickly. It takes years to build up EU production capacity apparently for this. We have been very late and we have demilitarized ourselves because we thought the world was peaceful. It's obviously not. And also Zelensky has said that Ukraine had received only one third of the promised 1 million sh shells. So North Korea in six months supply Russia with 3 million shells. Europe supply Ukraine with 330,000 shells during two years. It took two years to supply just 330,000. It also turns out, I've read that elsewhere, that North Korea has more heavy artillery shell production than all of NATO's combined production of artillery shells. So a little super poor country has more power there than all of NATO. How did that happen? It's outrageous. And of course, we need to start arming ourselves a lot in order to change that situation. And then, of course, there's United States that no longer sends artillery shells to Ukraine. So that flow has also stopped. That means they are in desperate lack of ammunition on the front lines. And that means Ukraines are dying as a result. That means Russians are able to move forward. But it's even worse than that. And I have some other examples of that. Okay, so the second reason that it's not going well on the battlefield for Ukraine currently is uh, because of Russian glider bombs that are dropped from airplanes about 50 to 60 kilometers behind enemy lines. So the Russian airplanes are at smaller risk of being shot down by Ukrainian anti-air rockets that simply don't have that range. And Ukraine don't have enough of these anti-air rockets uh, that have that range. They only have a few. That's the Patriot systems. But anyway, here we see it. I don't want to play the video because I don't want to violate any YouTube rules. But here we see a drop of three of these glider bombs. One, two, free you can see the smoke rising here and it's on a city and you can see there are some large buildings with many floors for comparison and scale these are bombs when they drop they make a crater of like 10 15 meter in diameter and they kill everybody within a radius of 40 meter uh, they are massive bombs. They can be like 500 kilo of explosive or one ton of explosives. And for comparison, the heavy artillery grenade is only like eight kilos of explosives. And they are supposed to be a big bang when they hit. But these glider bombs are much more heavy. And Russia has managed to increase production of these weapons quite a lot. And they are hammering the Ukrainian front lines with them. And they are killing the Ukrainians quite a lot. Now, Ukraine also got some glider bombs that they're throwing back at the Russians, but not on the same scale. Plus, the Ukrainian Air Force is not at all as big as the Russian Air Force. Russia has 300 airplanes they're attacking Ukraine with that can drop these glider bombs. Ukraine's Air Force, I don't know how many planes they have, but it's less than 100. So Ukraine desperately need to have these F-16 fighter jets that will come soon. But I'm just telling you that this is the other reason that it's going bad on the battlefield. These glider bombs and because Ukraine lacks long range anti-aircraft missiles that can stop these Russian airplanes from dropping glider bombs.
Now, there's also a third reason that Ukraine is losing on the battlefield currently, and that is that Russia has managed to increase its own production of cruise missiles and ballistic missiles and other kind of missiles that they are throwing at Ukraine. So they have increased their rocket attacks on Ukraine. And Russia is at the same time also starting to buy missiles from North Korea and Iran. And here we have a tweet that shows us troops have already launched at least 24 North Korean ballistic missiles at Ukraine. And then I have another tweet here that Reuters report that Iran has sent Russia ballistic missiles for the first time. More than 400 ballistic missiles have been sent from Iran to Russia and they have a range of 700 kilometers and carry 500 kilos of explosives. That means they can attack Ukrainian facilities deep inside Ukraine, which of course is valuable for the Russians and they just get extra capacity here. That's on top of all the 2,500 Shahid drones that have smaller warheads like 40 kilo of, of explosives that Russia has also gotten from Iran and they will get more stuff. And you know, NATO hasn't helped Ukraine with anything that can hit deep inside Russia. Nothing. Nor has West imposed sanctions on Iran for sending these weapons to Russia. They all ended these sanctions because Iran supposedly honored the deal about not developing nuclear weapons. They haven't honored that deal at all. They're developing nuclear weapons secretly and they're just lying about it. It's kind of depressing that we have so weak leaders here in the West that simply don't understand the situation, how serious this is and how close we are to losing our freedom and democracy because we don't focus on fighting back our enemies and don't arm ourselves with all the weapons we need in order to stop these people from taking over our countries. I'm saying that Ukraine, they are fighting our fight for democracy and we need to wake up and realize that we are actually on the line that all of Europe is in danger from being occupied by Russia if we don't wake up and start fighting back. And that's one of the reasons we should send troops to Ukraine, why this is not just a lunatic idea. No, it's real and it will become real. I think it might be sooner than we think. Either that or we lose it. We might not have a democracy and we might not have freedom anymore. Uh, but I don't want to end this uh, video with a negative tune to it. So let's talk where it's actually still going quite well for Ukraine, where they're hitting the Russians much more than, than Russia is hitting Ukraine. Now, one of the areas where Ukraine still have an advantage over Russia is the drone warfare with small drones that are used at the front line. And there's a statistic here I have found that somewhat shows that it shows here that from September 2023 to February 2024, Ukraine had 3,200 drones that were attacking infantry and Russia had almost the same number, 3,000 here. But then against positions, uh, Ukraine attacked 230 Russian positions and Russia attacked more. They actually attacked 800 positions on Ukraine. But then against vehicles, uh, here Ukraine has many more hits. Almost 3,000 Russian vehicles were hit by Ukraine and Russia hit about 1,000 vehicles that were Ukrainian. And here we have the total. Now these numbers has to be taken with a big grain of salt. The actual number are much bigger, but I think it's calculated by confirmed kills where there's some video footage of it. I have read other estimates that Ukraine and Russia are spending like 1,000 or 3,000 drones every single day of these small drones that they are flying at each other. And it's massive. A lot of people are killed with these small drones, but we just don't have any video footage of it. And also most drones, they miss their target or they don't explode or they run out of battery before they hit. So it's like only one out of eight that actually hit something. And how many of those are actually filmed and end up in a statistics like this? Anyway, I do think that Ukraine are ahead of Russia. Also, Russia is sanctioned, so they have a harder time acquiring these small drones than Ukraine that can simply buy them because they're not sanctioned. And NATO countries are also now picking up their own drone production and sending some of these drones to Ukraine. And we'll see much more of that in this year. So I think Ukraine might increase their advantage over Russia with regard to small drones. And another, just to keep up the good mood about where it's actually going forward for Ukraine, Ukraine is getting up and running with their own production of artillery shells, not as much as they need, 
but they also are coming up and running with own production of long-range drones that can be sent into Russia and attack Russian infrastructure and military bases and so forth. So there will be much more war inside Russia this year, and that will help Ukraine. And then, of course, the F-16 fighter jets that are coming to Ukraine. It won't be a game changer. Not until Ukraine got like 300 of those F-16 fighter jets will Ukraine get air superiority. And that might take three or four years. And God knows how the situation will be in three or four years from now. A lot of things can happen in between now and then. Uh, but I think this is my video. I hope you found it interesting. I certainly did find it interesting to do the research. And all I have to say now is that I hope you have a great life and live in freedom and democracy. Goodbye.